Okay, hello everyone who is coming in for the virtual tour of intentional communities. Welcome, welcome, one and all. Um, my name is Cynthia and I work with the Foundation for Intentional Community, FIC, as one of our co-directors. And I'm going to be the facilitator for today's panel discussion event. We have three wonderful intentional communities here with us. We have Ingeum, uh, Expressive Arts Village, Canticle Farm, and Bristol Village Co-housing. And uh, these are all communities that we got from Vermont, where I'm located, also at a community called Headwaters Eco Village. We're not going to be talking about my community today, um, but we have also communities from California and a whole diversity of co-housing, more eco village, more social justice oriented communities. So as always, when we do these virtual tours, it's just a great exploration of the diversity of the intentional communities movement. And I'm really glad to have all these folks with us. So I'm going to share my screen. I have a short uh, intro presentation to run through, and then we will get into hearing from each of the communities. So once again, if you're just tuning in, this is the virtual tour of intentional communities. This is a monthly event that we're doing where we hear a presentation from three different communities from our network and have time for Q&A and, and learning about these communities, as well as some discussion amongst all of the presenting communities. This is an event hosted on Zoom. We're in Zoom webinar mode. So that means that you um, will have a few options for asking questions. Really encourage you to raise your hand to ask your questions. We love hearing different voices. You can also put your questions in the Q&A uh, box if you want to type out your question. That's best for me to keep track of things. And then if you have a more general comment or a question for everyone else who is listening to the event, you can put that in the chat box. And we'd like you to really use the chat box as an opportunity to network with other people from all around the world who are listening to this event and interested in intentional community. You can use the chat box now to introduce yourself uh, share where you're calling from. If you live in, in the community, we'd love to know which one, and also what you hope to learn or get out of this session. So go ahead and find that, find that chat box and go ahead and, and put your information in there. And I'll briefly share about two upcoming events we have at ic.org slash events. Um, I am hosting on Tuesday next week an introduction to intentional communities. I'm going to go through all of the different types of intentional communities, a bit about um, some definitions and terms around what we mean when we say the word intentional community. And also I'm going to give you a really fun virtual tour of many of the communities that I have visited around the world, uh, all different types of eco-villages and co-housing, communes. Uh, so if you're new to the movement or really just want to get a better sense for the lay of the land of what this whole intentional communities world is about, I encourage you to, to join me for that session on uh, June 29th from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern. And we also have a really wonderful talk coming up with Eric Jackson, who's been doing some um, strong work with the Black community in Baltimore. And he's going to be offering a webinar on reparations, reparatory justice, and community land trusts. So really focusing in on practical steps that the intentional communities movement and really anyone can do to support Black communities specifically. Uh, so we're thrilled to have him on July 1st from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern. And once again, all those events are at ic.org slash events. 
Okay, so that's all that I have and we're going to get started here soon. So wherever you are in the world right now, just take a look around your space, make sure you don't have any too many distractions. Uh, maybe you want to have uh, something to drink nearby. We're going to be together for about 90 minutes and we won't be taking a break. So do what you need to take care of yourself. And if you want to have some note taking materials nearby, that can be handy. And just to yeah, sort of center yourself, arrive, whew, let go of whatever else may have been happening earlier in your day. And get ready to give your full attention to our three community presenters. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And a little bit about the format we're going to follow for this event. Um, each community will have about 10 minutes to present, and I, I already know each of you have really great uh, PowerPoint presentations and videos, so I'm excited to see that. And we'll have a short session of Q&A for questions specifically about that community, and then we'll move on to the next community. And then I have some uh, general questions that I want to toss around to this, this bunch of folks. Uh, and then after that, we'll open it up to Q&A from everyone who's listening. So that's the, that's the format. And we are going to start with uh, Ingeum Expressive Arts Village. And I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. <laughs> but uh, Jaspin, go ahead and really glad to have you here with us. Thank you for your time. Hi. Um, yeah, you were, you were close. It's Ingenium Expressive Arts Village. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we hear you great. Okay, um, hold on, let me get my view. Okay, um, yeah, so I'm Jasmine from Ingenium Expressive Arts Village. I'm here in Nevada City and it's about an hour north of Sacramento in California. Um, our primary focus here is on personal growth, relational growth and health and vitality. Um, and we also, each of us also has some expressive arts that we are into. It uh, doesn't have to be pro professional, but um, something that we enjoy and we share together. Um, um, yeah, I have a video. I'll just go ahead and share my screen and, and it's about a four minute video. So I will put that on.
There we have it. Um, so I, I will share some facts about Ingenium. Um, first, I'll start with what we are not. We are not an eco village. Um, we support sustainability, um, but it is not um, a major facet of our vision. We have a solar power array and we have small footprints and we have a nice big garden, um, but we're not an eco village. <laughs> um, uh, what we are, um, so um, I am the founder of Ingenium um, and at this point I am the sole owner of Ingenium. Um, we have uh, rentals, so we have five cabins plus an art barn, a common house and all the land. Um, so the cabins are for rent. We have three lots here. So all the cabins are um, spread across two lots. And our third lot is um, uh, available for seasoned members to build something new if they want to and also available for land partnership. So there is a potential for people to buy in as land partner. Uh, although in the beginning, at least for the first year, year and a half, we have people just rent, and that's to assess our compatibility together. Um, we have weekly residence meetings, and we have shared utilities. We have monthly cooperative processing together. Um, so part of uh, what we all have in common is per, uh, an affiliation for personal and relational growth. And so our monthly cooperative processing helps us to um, learn and practice NVC and um, consensus. Um, yeah, our cooperative processing is off the property and it's facilitated by um, somebody who has worked with Peter Cohen. Uh, but, um, so uh, random things we have here, movie nights and talent nights and um, barbecues on the beach and um, sometimes we would go on excursions off the land together. Um, one of our residents has a cabin up in Tahoe. So we've gone there together. Um, uh, other work days and special projects. Um, yeah, that's, that's an overview of who we are. So I can take questions now if there are some. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Yes. That was um, 
a really stunningly beautiful video. Um, oh, it was you. especially taken with the, the Grotto Sanctuary and that, that uh -huh. Oh my word, you're so lucky to have. Uh, thank you. That's the cherry on our cake. <laughs> okay. Yeah, to to have created such a place and get to live there, it's, it seems, yeah, lovely. So um, if anyone has uh, questions for Jaspin, uh, feel free to put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A box. Um, okay, a lot of questions coming in now. Okay. Um, can you just clarify where exactly the community is located? Yeah, we're in Nevada City, California, which is an hour north of Sacramento. Okay, nice. Yeah, I think someone may have missed that. Um, and what does the membership look like? Do you have adults and kids or, yeah, and, and, and how long do people tend to stay? Um, how about any members that don't actually live on site but are considered part of your membership? Okay. <laughs> Tell me that one question at a time. <laughs> uh, uh, how many members? So we have, uh, so it's five cabins. Right now we have seven full-time adults. Um, uh, one mi middle school age child, uh, two, one six-year-old, one three-year-old, and there's about four part-time uh, residents who are part or who are college college age students. So they're away when they're at college or at work, and then they come home when they when they're off and when they're free. Um, okay, so there was more. There was more to that. I didn't get. Um, how about members who uh, don't live on site? Sounds like most of your members live on site though. Yeah, we are full, with the rentals are full time. Um, people stay as long as they want to. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. how, how long do people tend to stay? Like a, a few? Um, so yeah, uh, let's see. Our, so we were established, I, I got the property in 2014 and started living here in 2016. Uh, the members who have been here the longest joined me when their cabins were completed in 2018. And uh, they are still here. Um, we have had uh, two people join and leave since then. So there are five cabins total. Um, our newest member has been here since uh, last August. Okay. So we're, we're still very, very new. Oh, okay, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. And I don't think anyone has put this question in the Q&A, but I'm curious, mm -hmm. how is it for you and the community to, yeah, like I heard you say very clearly, like I'm the, I'm the current owner of the property. How, yeah. how is that? Do you notice any interesting dynamics coming up with being a community with one owner? Interesting dynamics, indeed, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, the main thing is that, so uh, before COVID, we would give tours once a month. And so people would come and we have an extensive application process and people spend a few months uh, doing work on the land. And in that process, um, they assess us and we assess folks. What we found is that when people come, sometimes there's um, selective, what do you call it? S -s selective attention, maybe. Um, uh, and I think a big part of it is uh, making sure that everyone knows what we are and what our expectations are and what other folks' expectations are. So knowing that I am the sole owner, it's important to take in that, um, I have a certain role and um, for example, um, I set up what our work, we, we have a work trade, work trade situation. Everyone puts in 10 hours uh, of work per month and I set that up. Um, and if everyone is aware of that, then there's a list and you pick whatever job you wanna do off the list. Um, if you're not aware of that or if you don't quite get that expectation, um, folks have um, uh, come up with their own things to do. And so that's fine as long as it's presented to me and I can approve it because that list is, um, it takes care of our maintenance costs. As opposed to folks coming in and uh, feeling that this is more of an egalitarian format 
and they say, hey, let's let's build a sauna and if and let's count it as work hours. So basically, I'm paying for that sauna. Right. And if I don't wouldn't ordinarily pay for something like that, um, then that won't quite go. I pay for things like staining the cabins and things like that. So so I'm not sure if I'm explaining that dynamic very well, but um, it's about expectations, really taking in how our, what our structure is here and seeing if that melds with what you really want and what you really need. Does mm -hmm. that answer it at all? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, it sounds like you have kind of maybe the, the final say around certain um, decisions regarding the infrastructure and things that might, might be more expensive uh, for the That's community. True. Yeah, anything having to do with land ownership, then yes, although I am very open and that's something you won't really know or get to feel out until being here, that I am very open and that I ask for input. Um, I, I meet with each resident at least once a month and I ask for input or how is it going for you? What would you like to see added or things you feel would want changed? So I'm very open. Um, and I wear several hats. I'm the founder, I'm the landowner, and I'm a community member too. So um, yeah, it's an interesting dynamic to incorporate all of those at once. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it. Mm -hmm. And how about visiting? Lots of people are asking, can they visit you? And what's, what's the protocol for that? Yes, so right now we aren't having visitors unless you're hosted by one of our residents. We, we do have a guest cabin that people can stay in, but you need to be hosted by one of our residents, so know them. Um, when we have an opening, then, um, as I said before, we will most likely resume our monthly tours. And people can come uh, for a day and see what it is and ask a lot of questions. and. Um, before, during COVID, we had virtual tours and we might do that again because it enables people from out of the area to see what we're like. And we have a longer tour video uh, similar to what you just saw, but it's about 15 minutes long. Um, and then we had a tea party, uh, online tea party where people can come and after they've seen the tour and look through the website, if they're still interested, then they can ask more specific questions. Um, so right now, uh, to get involved, folks would, um, the ma main thing to do would be to go onto our website. It's very extensive. It explains more than you want to know. <laughs> and if you're still interested, join our Facebook group and or our meetup group. And we have, when we have an opening, we'll post it on there. And then we'll start to um, interact with people and people can come and visit after the tours and things like that. Okay. Okay, great. That's very helpful to know. Yeah. Um, and there's there's so many wonderful questions coming in through the chat and the Q&A box. Um, I'd encourage you maybe after you're done speaking to just go through and see if you want to answer more of them. Okay. Um, but let me see, maybe just one more question for you. Um, could you share a little bit about the inspiration for you to start the community? Like a little, a little bit more about your story and your journey for, for creating. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, so I am a single mom, and in 2014, I um I have one son. He's was in uh, the beginning years of high school back then, and I realized that oh, in a few years it's just going to be me, and where do I belong? You know, what do I want to do? And so I started researching uh, intentional communities and co-housing co communities, and I didn't quite find what I was looking for. So it was pretty much on a whim. I just thought, I wonder if there's any land in my area that would be conducive to having a, just a few cabins with like-minded and like-hearted folks around me. One thing led to another, and I found this place, and it turned out to be perfect. <laughs> and so, yeah, I actually... It, it's a job. It's a job to create a community, but it fell into place pretty easily. I just resources came to me really easily. Contractors and planners and, and engineers and handymen, you know, it's just it came really easily and I was able to put it together um, in a couple of years. And um, now I'm here in my cabin. Everyone has their own cabin and I have people around me who I enjoy. So that's the short version. 
<laughs> there you go. Wow. Well, it sounds like that was a relatively easy journey. I mean, I've definitely heard a lot of uh, much more difficult stories and struggles from community yeah. founders. And it's, a lot it's of work. Yeah, it's work and there were challenges, but my life experience before um, coming to the idea of developing this was such that it was very conducive. I've I've dealt with a lot of things, county and zoning regulations and uh, all kinds of things. And, you know, my background is in counseling psychology. So I have a broad uh, perspective as well as a very personal perspective too. So it, everything fell into place, but it is, it's a lot of work, yeah. but it's fun work for me. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. One last, one last question. How have the wildfires been for you all? Scary, yeah. very, very scary. Luckily nothing has hit us and we, that's our biggest risk here. And we we're, uh, have plans, uh, we're in the middle of clearing the property and we have plans for uh, grants to come so that we can clear more of our property. When I say clear, I don't mean clear cut. I just mean brushwork and uh, certain parameters of what we take down. Um, so for our property, we are very knowledgeable about that and we take good care about that as much as we can. Mm -hmm. We've had a, the, our closest fire was probably about five, four or five miles away as the crow flies. Um, that was, I think it was last summer. Um, so they happen, it's around. The, one thing that um, I have learned through this process is that it's important to both celebrate and engage your passion for being in and developing community. But at the same time, it's very important to have a, a, a healthy detachment and surrender as well. In a, any of our lives, anything can happen at any minute, including fire or anything else. And so it's really important to keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah. that seems like really good advice. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, fingers crossed for you all that you all stay safe and um, and that you continue to, yeah, sounds like grow and flourish in this in this community. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Well, um, and thank you everyone for your your awesome questions. Um, I hope I hope Jasmine, you'll you'll spend a little time in the chat thread and go through them. But now we're gonna move a bit further south, but still in California. And we're gonna now check out an urban intentional community. And that is Canticle Farm. We have Morgan and Orion with us. Looks like you two are in a yurt of some sort. Yeah, yeah, well, welcome. Looking forward to hearing about Canticle Farm. Welcome, thank you all. Um, just quickly, cause I know that I kind of hopped in a little few minutes in. My name is Orion Camaro and I'm grateful to be here. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, excited to, to tell you more about uh, where we are in, in Oakland, um, Oakland, California, Ch Chichenyo Ohlone Territory. Um, yeah, should I introduce? Yeah, maybe I'll try and do this. We were just figuring out last minute how we want to present to you all in just 10 short minutes. But my name's Morgan, she, her, and we wanted to begin by just sharing a, an invocation that we make every Sunday morning at our liturgy, which is a spiritual circle. And I don't have it right in front of me, so I'm trying to pull it up from memory, but it goes something like this. We name that we live in a nation created by enslavement and genocide of peoples, the taking and destruction of their lands and the justification of these acts by the Christian doctrine of discovery, manifest destiny, white supremacy, and the divine right of kings. We acknowledge that some of us continue to benefit from these injustices, and some of us continue to suffer from their impacts, and some of us experience both. We call on our ancestors to commit ourselves to transform rather than transmit the trauma with grace and humility. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks for being with us. And yeah, we always start by when we mention the history of Canticle Farm, acknowledging that we're on stolen indigenous land. And 
um, that this, yeah, this land where we are, Oakland, California, was a place of oak trees and creeks and salmon runs and home to community for thousands of years. And so here we are in this like capitalist urban landscape trying trying to figure out how to rebuild what the land already knows. And so we are a multiracial, interfaith, intergenerational, cross-class community of 41 people living in two locations, also up in Sierra Miwok territory, Calaveras County, east of here. We have 37 members here in seven houses, age one to 75. Um, and the land is primarily owned by a nonprofit with the mission to support people in the community to follow their soul work to see what is theirs to do in service of social and environmental justice. So I'll hand it to you. What do you want to add? Yeah, um, the way that this land um, is shaped is um, there are, I want to say what, seven, actually eight houses now, eight houses that um, make up the property nestled between two streets. Um, and we've torn down fences between all those houses to create a sort of permaculture garden um, space. Um, and a lot of the work that happens here is very varied, um, uh, ranging from folks that um, support and nurture other grassroots organizations. Some of us um, are filmmakers, some of us are artists, some of us do wealth dis redistribution work, others of us um, advocate against the school to prison pipeline, other of us are trying to protect, um, yeah, trying to fight against climate change. There's just so many different issues and people representing here. Um, and um, we do, a, uh, we kind of also do a mixture of outward and inward facing work in our community and outside. So we have a weekly food distribution um, where we've partnered to distribute food to the community every Thursday um and um also teach herbalism and also just social the sort of principles that help guide us here we teach to local high schools um that come um and participate in our programs um and yeah i think that what's really powerful about this community as well is that we're kind of built out of um a really beautiful framework that kind of guides the community called the work that reconnects and by joanna macy and so we're really led by the sort of like epic super story of the great turning and the great unraveling recognizing that you know the great unraveling is all of the different social ills and um, issues that we fight against um, but then the, the great turning is how are we able to be moved into trying to tell a new story and to shape um, a new way of being um, and so, yeah, it's a very interdisciplinary community. It's really exciting to be able to learn from each other. And um, we are a really tight knit community um, that also embody nonviolent communication in, in our practices. And so we try to like um, kind of be loving with each other and be relational rather than um, uh, default to uh, sort of like blame or shame. Um, and that's obviously an ongoing practice. We are always like, continually trying to understand what that looks like and how we um, work together in compassion and navigate um, challenges which emerge in any intentional community but um, yeah that's a little bit about sort of mm -hmm. things that happen here also I use they he, she pronouns and um, just I know that was, that was like a random end we're <laughs> getting to know ourselves yeah here, we're just, we here we are yeah yay maybe I'll share just a little bit more about some of the folks that live here we have like different kind of residential programs or like pathways into being here and like um, both of us came through the house which has been dedicated to supporting young activists and organizers so we've been here like four or five years now and um and we have another house that supports men who've been pulled from life sentences in prison who are doing restorative justice work in the community we have uh, another house that is just kind of 
beginning with its first residence that's supporting asylum seeking folks, particularly queer folks and, and women and children from Central America. We have another house that supports indigenous people. And then the family that started this place, they have two houses and we had a baby born here during the pandemic and he's the sixth generation of his family in this neighborhood. Um, yeah, so we're a wild family. And like, it's like this experience of like, all the time, like, wow, what, what a blessing, like, how did life come to bring us together in this way? And a lot of what we get to do is learn, learn from our differences, learn from our experiences, and the ways that like collaboration and healing and organizing can happen when we're here, bridging so many different issues and identities. Um, so yeah, we wanted to show you all a little video. Anything else you want to say? Okay, we want to show you a little video. Recently, the seventh house joined our community and we were able to um, have a ceremony to take down the fence between the land and the new house and invited all of our the donors that helped make that house possible to come join us. Um, so let me share screen. take y'all outside you want to say another thing while i get the other camera set up yeah sure um yeah i guess i would just venture to say as we share outside that um this place has been really built out of um just a love for all people we're really inspired by saint francis the Sicilian. um and yeah i don't know um yeah i'm just excited to share with you i don't know we'll just here, I'm gonna walk you around. Let me stop this video. That one. So we just came out of the yurt, which is where I live. And now we're here in the center of the garden. Here, let's walk this way. Or you want to be the tour guide? So yeah, I'll hold the video. So um, this is um, the middle of the garden here. We have a um, so there's different parts of the property. This is Sister Death, and usually it's a it's a pond, but now it's a sort of place of reflection. And we usually um, use this space as a place um, to contemplate, to breathe. Um, and it's sort of a space that like also has like a sort of spiral walkway through, and it, it's super beautiful. Um, should we go this way? This way. Let's go that way. Okay. Um, over here, as we go on, there's more parts of the garden. Uh, Right here, this is uh, Sister Moon and Sister Stars. That's the name of this house. This is the house that we're talking about that we uh, that I live in that supports uh, social environmental justice mm -hmm. activists, youth activists. In the bottom floor is our new community space that we yeah. just finished. Let's show them the community space. So <laughs> this space is going to be served as a, a communal communal kitchen and um, dining space as well as. Um, uh, a community venue for like workshops and film screenings and just ways to support um yeah different like the community because this just got finished and it's like an 18, 19 month construction process and it's really a wild endeavor. Um this is the like kitchen kitchen the new kitchen um yeah can you take them to the creek yeah here I'll just point out like, here's an example of a rain garden. That cat is called Ito. Um, 
We also have, we're doing this bioremediation project. We have a grandfathered in well where we're pumping the water through a series of wetland pools. And obviously being in California, water conservation is really important to us. This garden here is fed by the gray water from the showers in this house. Um, and then on the roof of this house, we also have a big battery backed solar array. Apple tree. Apple tree. Um, here there's a, there's a space that's called the Blue Lodge. And it's like for people whose bodies bleed specifically so that they can have a sort of space to process on their moon time. Um, this is a little greenhouse. And then we just restored this tree, actually. So um, in our neighborhood in Fruitvale, there's a, a whole a slew of creeks. And this one was um, unearthed. We just like um, unearthed the creek and are trying to restore it so that water can flow, um, you know, when water eventually does flow. And it's been a, such a beautiful endeavor for the community um, to unearth and revitalize this creek. Uh, here we have our couple of our beehives. Um, that we're tending. Um, they've swarmed a lot this summer, super healthy. Um, a community member, Julia, come, um, like a friend, Julia comes and helps tend them with us. This is a community arts space where we do, um, we can make uh, different visual art. Um, also people have recorded music in there. It's been a, a sweet space. One of our um, friends, Harrison, actually built this giant, like, what is it, cob? Mm -hmm. Called, um, external. <laughs> Sorry. You're doing good. Work. And work. this space right here, this is our fire circle. So this is where we have all of our meetings and a lot of community events happen right here. Mm -hmm. Some more parts to the garden. This is a, um, one of our dear friends, corn, corn fields and some other um, greens. This is where the fence was that you, we showed you the video for when it came down. Um, maybe the RJ space is yeah. the last thing. Yeah, we can RJ space. Um, so over here we have uh, a restorative justice space that's designated specifically to uh, to be able to uh, have folks if there's conflict in the community. Um, we have this window here just um, to to have a, a space in which we can um, have circles where we can process and clear conflict. Um, with, with the idea being that like, you know, the conflict that happens between two people is a conflict that is impacts the entire community. So how do we kind of, kind of support a nurturing space where that is designated to like heal and process those things. And then the house that supports uh, asylum seekers is right here as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That was probably more than 10 minutes. Thanks y'all, excited to answer your questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Morgan and Orion. That was so powerful. And I loved how you started with the invocation and gave us a tour of the space. And um, I, I, so I, I, you're bringing back to my mind when I had the chance to visit you all very briefly. And, um, and what, what people didn't see through your tour just now is the surrounding area because you're really you know you see all these beautiful gardens and everything but you all are in oakland in the city and you come <laughs> out busy city streets and then you enter in this like this paradise so i i just i give so much um appreciation for both of you for being there and your work and for the community for doing that work yeah thanks thank you it's true we're in the middle of the city <laughs> yes all right, so let me see what questions we have for you. Uh, let's see here. Um, do, um, do the members that you have living there, um, do they pay to live there or do you have subsidies through grants? How does, how does that situation work? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm the one that does like bookkeeping and finances and fundraising. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, we operate in what we call a gift economy. And so all of our programs and living here and everything that happens here is offered as a gift and folks are welcome to give money in return if they're in the financial position to be able to, but there's no like price 
So there's no rent for living here. Um, there's no expectation on anyone to contribute, though some residents are financially able to do at an amount that they determine. Um, and then the rest, so about a third of our budget comes from residents and then about two thirds of our budget comes from external donations. Okay, okay, wow. Well, you know, I, I think we, we hear a lot about gift economy as some ideal and it's incredible that you all are putting it into practice. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Doing our best. Trying. Doing our best. <laughs> Figuring it out. And maybe I'll say that that I think is one of the things that is really special about this place is like what happens in someone's being when they're not having to hustle to make rent every month. Like yeah. the amount of like imagination and creativity and just time that frees up to really be of service in the ways that people are called to. Yeah, there's so many, that's the beautiful thing too about Canticle is that it's helped uh, incubate and activate so many different social movement efforts that each of us are holding and, and so many different organizations and um, issues have been nurtured here um, by virtue of that gift. And so what's really powerful is that that momentum that sparks the ability for us to be able to do change making work in all the different ways that we do. Okay, great. Okay, so I have a interesting question that's come through. Um, there's a there's a question from Danielle. I lived at Canticle Farm 10 years ago, and I'm curious to get your sense about what continues to make things work so abundantly smoothly there. Do you think it's Annie's influence and members like Pancho and Adelaja, or is it more of a technical influence via the format or style of governance and decision-making that is practiced? Mm, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, lo I love that you provided some <laughs> pre-answers. <laughs> um, I mean, I definitely think it's, I think it's the strength of relational community that's here. Um, some of the community members you named aren't, don't, ex don't live here currently, but um, their impacts are definitely felt. And um, the lineage of how many stories have been nurtured here is so profound. Um, and I think that like, Annie talks a lot about this thing called a morph morphogenic field, uh, about like how when a space um, has a culture that's set, like that culture evolves and grows and connects with like the people that are here and part of the community, um, whether it's in the present or the past. And so I definitely feel like that feels true to me about like how the practice of nonviolent communication and um, compassion being really at the center of Canticle has really like nurtured that field to grow and, and be vibrant. Um, that's sort of an initial take on it. I'm curious what you have to say, Morgan. Yeah, I mean, I would also say that things aren't always smooth and, but we don't, we don't expect them to be. We like see that like conflict and disarray and what can even sometimes feel like chaos are like part of the experience of being human and part of the experience of being in community together, so. We like do our best to weather that and learn from it. And then also we talk a lot about emergence. So like there's no strategic plan at Canticle Farm. We always talk about like, yeah, just the things that happen like arise based on people's like passions and like what they're called to. And so it's like each thing that shows up is made possible by like someone in the community feeling called to make it happen. And I think that principle allows things to like grow and die and change at a pace that like makes sense for like, yeah, capacity of the land and its people. Mm. And do you allow visitors or do you have a visitors protocol? <laughs> yeah, um, before the pandemic, we were hosting like 200 visitors a year. Um, so yeah, we definitely can take visitors. We can't always say yes, but you know, when there's capacity to, to host people, we always want to say yes. We have a dedicated guest room in the new community space. Um, yeah, so if folks watching this do want to visit, reach out and we'll see what might be possible. Okay, all right, wonderful. 
Oh, well, thank you again so much for, for that tour and all of your work and congratulations on the new community space. It looks gorgeous. Yeah. Thanks. Do you want to say any words of Bible? You know, you have to go. Yeah, um, just want to send so much gratitude for you all out there um, in Teshin communities. I feel like uh, a really big part of the great turning or just the, just the world that we want to build. So just so grateful for you all and in, in, in that and sharing that vision and that dream with y'all. And um, yeah, just much love. Hope you have a beautiful day and I'll see y'all. See y'all, maybe. maybe yeah, visit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Ren. Good. Okay. Oh, well, um, again, you may want to check out the Q and A box in the chat. There may be some more questions there you want to answer. Um, but yeah. Okay. So now, and, and truly, we've seen all this diversity of community. We're going to see yet another intentional community going over now from the west coast to the east coast, pretty close to where I am in Vermont. We're going to hear from Bristol Village co-housing from Jim and Howard. And thank you both for being here. And uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm curious to learn more about Bristol co-housing. Okay, well, we've, to share? we've got a little sl slideshow to go through. We'll try to go through it quickly and have time for Q&A. But um, Jim, if you wanna go ahead and start the share. Um, so we got to go back. Yep. Hmm. <clears throat> we do this without sharing the screen. Well, stop share and then open it to the first slide, I guess. Or, or do we stop share already? Yeah, we do. Yeah, all right. So let's, no, we're in share. So, so where's the stop share? Um, Sorry about this. Um, no worries, it happens. This is... <laughs> Part of what we're all getting used to, the technical challenges of Zoom and. That's it right there. So can we just open it up? Where is it? Right there. Yeah, we're on a different computer from what I usually use. This one, double click that. Okay. And you have to. We were at the beginning. So mm -hmm. now we do start chair. Oops, I didn't do it. So go back to share. Okay. Okay. All righty. All right. Hopefully, slide share will work for us here. Um, <clears throat> if not, we can do it not in full screen. Uh, so, all right, here we go. So we are in the little town of Bristol, Vermont, uh, of a town of about 3,500 people built on land taken from the Abenaki people, uh, as is our co-housing community. But Bristol is a, an incredibly vibrant little town. Um, six restaurants, um, art galleries, uh, or one art gallery, uh, a brew pub, live music, um, you know, healing arts, uh, massage, uh, yoga studios, uh, a full-size grocery store and, and uh, drug store. And our little community is all within walking distance of this, just outside the left uh, frame of this photograph. So it's a wonderful place to live and have a walkable community environment. Um, we have 14 families on about two and a half acres, 25 adults and five kids. You can see the age range there uh, coming here from all over. And uh, construction started in 2016 and now we're fully occupied. 
Uh, the community is based on green planning and design principles, super insulated buildings, heat pumps, solar panels, uh, green storm water management. Um, and we've gotten awards for historic preservation and energy conservation. So we're, we're not really an eco village, but we're trying to walk the eco village and, and uh, do, do right by the environment, uh, I guess you might say. Um, we do, um, this is a condo ownership form basically. So each family does own a 14th of the property and we have our own houses and a lot of common facilities as you'll see. Um, one of the, we are a pure co-housing community um, in that we have shared facilities and private homes. Uh, we engender a strong sense of neighborhood, both physically and in terms of the activities and way we relate with each other. Community meals and activities in the common house and all over the place, as you'll see. And it's a really supportive, safe, fun place for grown-ups and kids. And we really think we've got a great balance here of community and privacy, which is key to all of us. Um, this is our site plan. The downtown Bristol is right off the map here. Literally the drugstore is right along this property line. Uh, our common green is actually our leach field, uh, very creatively used as a little New England town green sort of situation. Here on North Street, we've preserved a couple of historic buildings and added in some newer infill buildings built to look compatible. Our, our common house is here in this 1863 mansion. We've got two storage barns. Um, we've got a workshop. Parking is in lots on the periphery. So the center of the place is all pedestrian oriented. We've got a little orchard down here that's just newly planted a few weeks ago. Our community gardens and compost operation and a nice stone circle meditation area are up here in what we call the Northeast Kingdom, which to Vermonters that has a special meaning. But I really want to take this second to honor Jim and his wife Peg who founded this place and did a ton of research, visited lots of communities, got input from prospective um, community members, and they've just done a superb job of making this physical site plan embody the kind of principles in the community uh, to make it function the way we want to live in it. And it's, it's just an incredible place to live. Um, here's our green and you can see downtown Bristol right over here. And we're nestled in between uh, mountains and the foothills of the Green Mountains. That's a designated wilderness area there. Um, you see the cottages on the west east side of the green. And then here is North Street, um, one of the old houses on the right, built in 1813, a new infill structure um, designed to look compatible next to it there. Uh, we recently renovated the old ramshackle picket fence, mix our labor with our land kind of thing. Um, this is the backside of those same buildings with uh, multifamily units overlooking the green on the other side. And this is just a classic kind of interaction that happens when you've got a community pathway there right alongside private uh, yards and people visiting over the fence and the com one of our dogs mm -hmm. coming to visit me as I'm taking the picture. Uh, it's just, the, this happens again and again and again all the time. It's just a great blend of community and privacy in a beautiful town setting. Um, community facilities are key to all of this. Our common house was built in 1863, uh, uh, then one of the premier mansions of the community. Uh, a nice cathedral ceiling addition on the back, cafe and kitchen there for community meals and meetings. Uh, elegant old parlors where we have little impromptu gatherings, practice yoga in there. Um, uh, basement recreation facilities. Uh, and exercise equipment. Uh, the barn from the same era is right behind the house there. We store all our bikes, our skis, um, 
gardening equipment, snow blowers, lawn mowers, uh, hand tools, all of that stuff. The barns are just an incredible resource uh, for us. And an adjacent workshop that has these uh, commonly owned tools, power tools and hand tools. So it helps us a lot in keeping the place going. And one day we'll give some TLC to the outside of the workshop too. Uh, community garden beds here just recently planted. And we have uh, two Yora steel and insulated compost tumblers that work beautifully well, even in the cold Vermont winters. Uh, our south barn with two new EV charging stations we've recently put in and with plans to do more as owners get more EVs. And here's on the, on the back south side of the property, our little fledging orchard of trees just planted a, a few weeks ago and our sw drainage swale is part of our green stormwater management system that lets the water seep into the ground instead of uh, into the piped into the rivers and streams or flood over into the Rite Aid parking lot next door, which it used to do before we put in the dry wells. Uh, community clothesline. And another piece of unseen community infrastructure is really important. It's our gather communication tools. Here you see our page with information on all our members, uh, contact info, doctors and prescriptions, driver's license, I mean, vehicle license numbers, um, uh, pages that uh, where you can click a link to all of our documents gathered by committees and other functions. It's a hugely important thing. Calendars to schedule um, events in the common house, uh, things like that. Really an important part of our governance here. Um, community life um, happens in some structured and unstructured ways. Um, our weekly pre-COVID um, community meals were a great thing, great camaraderie and uh, bonding opportunities. Our monthly community meetings are part of how we're governed. Um, major decisions are made at the community level and we have seven committees, which is too many. We're trying to consolidate, do the real work of funneling big decisions up to the community. Um, technically speaking, one vote per household. Our, our board of directors is our households and we're trying to work toward a consent decision-making process and streamlining our committee structure a bit. Right now we're consensus in that does create some problems at times. Um, workdays is our monthly workday is another of our major uh, opportunities for fun and bonding and keeping the place going, making our gardens, renovating our barns and painting them. Um, then there's a whole plethora of jobs, roughly a hundred jobs, large and small that need to be done. And so people sign up for those, whether it's snow blowing, or mowing the green. We've tried out a new, more creative uh, pattern of mowing and we're moving toward clover in the uh, edges of the, of the green there. Uh, cleaning the common house, watering the gardens and weeding and all those things. Uh, and one of those jobs a little team works on is taking the recycling and the trash to the horse drawn uh, trash wagon that the town provides to collect uh, refuge and recycling in town. Really a sweet little part of our little town life here. Uh, but then all kinds of impromptu things that, uh, you know, community potlucks, they don't just happen spontaneously. Our um, marketing and community relations committee has a feel good circle that helps bring people together for special things. We do Halloween, big time, just free play on the green. Um, this was a, you guessed it, Valentine's Day thing during COVID outside the common house there on the left. Uh, maple sugaring with sap from our own trees here on the property. Uh, birthday celebrations, uh, lots of fun working with the kids to do things, cooking the meals, um, having fun at work day. We are activists for causes we believe in and a big climate march started here uh, at our common house. 
And even during COVID, we did the best we could to maintain our sense of community, which here was pretty easy, but we did happy hours on Zoom, which ironically was a chance for us to get to know each other better and on deeper levels than actually happened when we were in a crowded room for our community meals. So um, for us, you know, it's all about community. And a lot of people ask me, how do you like co-housing? And one thing I usually say is that before I moved here, I thought it was gonna be a really good thing, but I was wrong. It's uh, way, way better than anything I could have imagined. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And uh, if there are questions, uh, I'll throw most of those to Jim. Okay, thank you so much for that presentation. And I well, love- let me, add, let me add in one, one thing I forgot to say. Um, uh, my wife started a singing group called Singers of the Great Turning and in honor of the great turning. And we are totally down for those principles. Uh, I don't know that we're walking them as thoroughly as you guys are at Canticle Farms, but uh, we're with you. So carry on. Great. Great. Aww. Well, I loved those photos of your community and especially getting to see the horse-drawn carriage for the, the garbage collection. That's incredible. I, yeah, just we're kudos told, to you guys for what you're creating there. We're told it's the only one like that in the country, but um, if someone else has one, we'd like to know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> wow, cool. Good. Okay, let me see what what questions we have here. Um, yeah, I was also very intrigued by this um, the the platform you had mentioned the gather platform. I think it's it's called. Can you share a little bit more about yes. that? Um, I found I out. Are curious. Yes, I was at a, a co. I went. I've been to maybe five or six co housing conferences. They happen every year or every other year. Um, and this one, I think, was in. Uh, possibly Nashville or Portland. I mean, I can't, can't even remember. Um, there's a lot of co-housing conferences. And there was someone in the audience of actually of one of the sessions who just put his hand up and said, I have something like this. And I went over to him, talked to him. He's from the Midwest and he lives in co-housing, I think in Madison, Wisconsin. And he um, is part of a software company that specifically made this program for co-housing communities because he lives in co-housing. So we got in contact, his name's Tom Smith. And we can, anybody who wants to know more about it, we can put you in touch with him. Um, and it's been a great resource for us um, because it really helps to organize what we're doing in the community because you can get minutes of any meeting, um, all the rules, the policies, everything you need to know is in one place. Plus, if, you, if a car needs to be moved, we know how to find that car because they're all listed on Gather or whatever you need to know. So it's it's really a great resource. Awesome. Yeah, and I see the, thank you, Neil, for putting that link in the chat to gather.coop. Seems like a great resource other communities might want to check out. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, um, let me see. Oh, well, um, this, I, I wonder how you'll respond to this question. Um, clearly, you know, we're, we're, you all have expressed, you know, about wanting to um, aspire to the great turning. And we've just heard from Canticle Farm where they're doing a lot of work with seems like racial justice and bringing more diversity in the community. Um, how about having people of color, of color at Bristol Village? What does that look like for you all? Okay, well, um, we, um, as you probably know, Vermont, um, I think it's known as the whitest state um, in the country right now. Um, we are having more people of color come because we have a lot of refugees that are coming from um, all around the world. Um, and they happen, they, they live mainly in Burlington and Winooski, which are about 45 minutes from here. And we have inquired about having refugees be able to live here and unfortunately, um, we have been turned down because the refugee population needs a lot of assistance and all the infrastructure for that is in Burlington and Winooski. So they don't really want refugees just stuck in the middle of a town that um, is, you know, doesn't have that type of situation. Um, 
we have um, people that rented here that are of color. Um, we try to make um, our, some of our facilities are rented out now, um, which makes it more affordable. Um, but in co-housing in general, and in own, and home ownership in general, it's really hard for young families or people of color to actually um, be able to afford it. So now I've joined the co-housing board, the national co-housing board. And one of my goals is to create a re revolving loan fund so that um, perhaps communities can um, get funding to actually have people of color and young people be, be able to move in. But this is a problem for all of co-housing that it's um, really hard to, since it's an ownership situation, not a rental situation, it's really hard for any family, particularly with student loans or whatever, they don't have the resources to buy. So we have one, we have two rentals right now, um, um, and we po po perhaps could make more rentals in the future. But otherwise, it's really hard to to get um, lower income people into our community. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for such a thorough answer of that. <laughs> and. Um, yeah, let's maybe connect around the revolving loan fund project because that's been an idea on oh. the back burner for the FIC as well. Yes, let so us do that. that. I, I just was in a board meeting like two days ago and I said it and I got a lot of thumbs up and then someone said, oh, it's so hard to do. How can you do it? And it's like you have the naysayers. It's going to be we have to overcome people that say you can't do it. And I'm I'm willing to work on it. That's why I joined the board. So oh, amazing. Wow. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that work and, and bringing that idea forward. I think it could be really powerful. Awesome. Okay. Uh, well, I think that's most of the questions uh, for, for each of you and for all of you guys, just, yeah, feel free to, yeah, keep looking. I did, did want to just box. say one thing about how we came to be in Bristol because um, it happened through my wife um, who's not here. I mean, she's upstairs actually. <laughs> and um, there's this beautiful common house, which we share um, was for sale. And we, we looked at it and said, oh, that's really beautiful. And she loves, she wanted to always live in a Victorian house. I don't know. <laughs> and this is actually Italian aid. So it doesn't really meet that need. But um, we said, well, that doesn't, you know, if anything, we're gonna downsize. And this is a huge house and we can't afford it anyway. Um, and then two other properties went for sale next door. Actually, it's one property with two different houses and the backyard. So we actually built in the backyards of three of two basic properties that happened to be for sale at the same time in Bristol, in downtown Bristol. Um, so it was a way of taking a house that was built by, by someone who's very wealthy, um, the Peak family. They have a big history here. Um, they have, he had ancient, uh, he had cars, um, that really old cars that he he um, would collect. We still have some of the windshields in our barn, and we now share this house, which with fourteen families. So that is like a to me is like a really great thing is to take you know some of these things that the wealthy had that one person one or one family lived in and then share it with many families. Um, so that's how this all came into being. Um, was this, we were, we were lucked out that we had these properties all for sale at the same time in the center of a village. That's all walkable. So it's, it's a dream come true in that way. Amazing, amazing, yeah. great. Uh, okay, well, we're about to move into the um, part of the session where we just open it up to general questions that anyone listening has for any or all of the presenters. Um, and I wanted to start with a question um, for each of you. And I think you each touched on it in, in different ways through your presentation. But if you could just highlight for us why you think intentional community is important, particularly in this, this time, this moment, um, especially for someone who is not yet living in an intentional community, what, you know, what, what, why is it important to have these places in existence, to live in such places? And we'll just go popcorn style. Whoever wants to share first can go ahead. I, I actually have something that I've always been interested in cooperatives and cooperative decision-making 
And I think co-housing and the other intentional communities that I'm hearing about, all of them that, you know, in this presentation, how do you, how do you make decisions with um, a bunch of people and have it so that you actually can agree on anything? And so we've been working really hard on a system called sociocracy, um, which um, is gaining traction. Um, and I think I see this type of decision-making translating to the government, to corporations. So we're, I think we're on the cutting edge of how, how do you make decisions so everyone has a say? Because we know we live in a world where that is the opposite of what's going on. We have more and more tyrants that are running the world. They, they're making all the decisions for us. And I think we need to have a model where we gain strength through cooperative decision-making. So I think um, all these intentional communities are doing that. Yeah. So. Great. How I would answer that question is we think a lot here in the community about how, you know, for millennia, humans, people lived in village, like yes, there were migratory people, but many, many humans around the world did live in villages. And in particular, in this experiment of a nation state called the United States, we have this situation where some people were brought here against their will. Some people had their land colonized and taken over. Some people are the colonizers. And that thing we've only been doing for like 400 years. And then we had Jim Crow and segregation, and we had so we've really only had like 50 years of attempting to live together across difference. And we see the violent impacts of how much that is failing all across our country. And so we, it's like we're trying to do here with 40 people what we know at least for America needs to happen, that we need to figure out how to live across cultural, religious, um, all sorts of practices, diversity. And so what I always say personally about my experience living here is like when it's going well, when there's just these incredible moments of connection and healing, there's this sense of like the most profound hope of like, oh, wow, we can actually figure out how to do this as human people in this moment in time. And then when it's going badly, I get to like really touch in on my despair of like, oh my God, like if we can't do this with 40 people, how do we do it with hundreds of millions of people? And I'm so grateful to live in that oscillation between like big hope and big despair rather than like avoiding the whole situation and being somewhere in the middle. Thank you. Yeah, I come to it more from a personal perspective. Um, the importance of uh, intentional community for me has been about um, coming out of isolation, um, gaining a sense of belonging and purpose and gathering with people who have like values and uh, like perspective and like heart and uh, not only modeling how to live together with like people, but also um, uh, uh, offering service to the broader community from that place or offering a perspective to the broader community from that place. Yeah. Great. And Howard, do you want to add anything? Sure. Well, um, to me, uh, what we're living here in our co-housing and what most co-housing opportunities and intentional communities offer is is ways to create a better sense of neighborhood where people know each other, they support each other. You know, it, it creates an environment for, you know, for countering the great unraveling that's going on all around us. And um, it's, it's a way we all can be part of that great turning. And, um, you know, how to replicate it at, at scale is, is a big challenge and it's hard, uh, so hard because of financing and zoning and, and you know, cultural resistance and all that stuff. Um, but so important today, so important today. 
That's a great segue into my next question. It was actually put in the chat earlier by Lori and it was for Bristol Village, but I, I wonder if um, all of you can answer this question. Uh, did you have any challenges getting acceptance from the, the like the wider community or region where you're where you're creating your community? Um, Lori says, I live in Muir Commons in Davis, California, and we had to talk to the neighbors to tell them that we're not a hippie commune and we had mortgages, etc. Now we get along fine. Um, how, how is it with each of you in your own context? Well, I do have a, a little story, which is that um, we had some older ladies come over when we first came in. I think we were just finishing construction and people were starting to move in. And they came in and they said, oh, well, so do you like, do you all like live together? And like, how do you deal with, you know, like the bathrooms and like, do you showers together? You know, it's like, <laughs> they, they thought we were like, you know, basically one big happy family that all lived as, you know, so we do you we have consensual sex with each other, right? Or, <laughs> right. right. So um, we explained that we um, all have private homes and we have communal facilities, but we're we we are all have we're, there's a it's both private and communal. Um, and then we had people that were walking through our property before we were here, and they were upset they couldn't walk through anymore. Cause like, well, aren't you just like a public place that we can just walk through? So we have something called front porch forum where people post things. And so people were posting and all have this whole thing going on. Um, and so that all dissipated because basically, you know, even though um, we don't mind having a lot of visitors, we don't want like it to be a thoroughfare of like people just walking through to get from one place to another. Um, but I don't think, um, we, I think the business community was very receptive because here we had some new families that could actually shop on Main Street and were right next door. So that was a big influence that um, people saw that, I mean, they got to know us over time. So, but you know, some people probably still think we're hippies. Maybe we are, so. <laughs> we, we can aspire to that, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Not bad to be happy, yeah, whatever. Yeah. But open houses uh, help. Um, we had a rat issue and it turned out it, we had rats in our compost. And so we worked with the neighbors who also had rats uh, of their own. But, you know, on an issue basis, we really bonded with some of the surrounding neighbors who were facing the same stuff. And now they're, they're loving our metal clad composters. And so, you know, it's just a, a matter of really reaching out to just be active members of the whole community and it, and it works so well. Yeah, we had a grand opening where pe anyone could come. We had maybe 300 people come. And they, they got to see, we do tours all the time. We invite people for tours and okay. show them what we have. Cool. Yeah, same, same here. Um, when I was in S, we had, we had a, I had a six month escrow for our property and during that escrow period, um, the building department told me that they have never had, uh, so many visits from my neighborhood about one property as they did my, my property. They did not want me to buy this property. And like Jim and Howard, um, there was a preconceived notion that we would be a naked hippie commune growing all kinds of drugs and doing all kinds of sound, fun sounding things that are not condoned. <laughs> so yeah, there was quite an embedded, in fact, they formed um, a group and they would meet weekly and just tr really tried hard to uh, get me to not buy the property. Wow. Um, yeah, so uh, there were many meetings. Um, at one point I had our facilitator, I mentioned about that we do cooperative processing once a month. So I had our facilitator and my, uh, land, my planner and my contractor, we all had a meeting. We called a meeting with all, uh, the neighbors that were concerned and we met with them several times. And um, yeah, we got to a place where we actually changed the land structure around us and and bought part of uh, one of my neighbor's properties. So we actually mediated it and worked so that 
things are much better. And so, yeah, it's just as Jim and Howard said, it's through time, only through time and experience, they got to see that we are very clean. We cleaned up this land. Um, there was an issue with squatters on the neighboring empty property. Um, we call, and again, we called a meeting of all the surrounding neighbors and converged on a plan of how to address that together. Um, we had a tour here once just for the neighbors. Um, and now we get invited to their winter gatherings and we share fruit and we have eggs that we share. And so um, there are still, I think there are still neighbors who still have this conception of something not quite right is going on, <laughs> but those neighbors don't come to our tours or our open houses. So um, you, can't, you, you can't stop that, but what you can do is show and invite as much as possible. And then they can see the reality of what it is. can speak to this question from the urban context we probably have like thousands of neighbors <laughs> just you know we we're touching on both streets and yeah probably within a half mile there's like several thousand people so lots of neighbors and um yeah folks have tons of varying relationships with us from never having heard of this place it's possible to just walk by and not know we're here it just looks like normal houses on the street from the outside um, to folks that come to our neighborhood food distribution we also have a neighborhood kids program on Mondays so some people's kids come here um, and then yeah I think there are people who are like that's weird like <laughs> there's so many people that live there but I think in general there's like yeah, there's opportunities to visit and get to know us. And and I think it also helps that the family that started this place has been on this exact property for 40 years and in the neighborhood for six generations. And so they have a ton of relationships and, and belonging here. Okay, great. Yep, how are you on the six? I've got... Uh... One question and one kudo for Morgan and Canticle Farms. I mean, what you guys are doing is just incredible. It really blows me away, your commitment to social justice, environmental justice, and, and your ability to uh, take the financial pressure off so you can have the kind of diversity you do. And the concept of fundraising outside the community to enable that is just incredible. So. Uh, hats off to you. Um, in the minute or two we've got left, I wonder if you can say anything about how you how you work your financial plan and your fundraising and all of that. I would say there's people that come through here to visit or as part of a program who are moved. Like they, you know, sometimes they might show up six months later being like, I'm actually a person with wealth and I'm able to give 10000 a year or something like that. There's also people that give $5 a month. There's people that just like drop dollar bills in the little like box for contributions. Um, we do have some foundation grants, both that support specific programs, whether they're in support of formerly incarcerated people and their leadership and movement to end mass incarceration or supporting our asylum program specifically. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't say we have a plan, just relationships and people showing up and feeling moved and contributing in, in the ways that they can. And we've also, we've never had bank debt. All of our house purchases have been funded with gifts and private unsecured debt to individuals who were in the position to be able to do that. I just have a quick question. How, you built a common house. Um, and how did you make that decision? Because who, who made that decision? Or did you just take a vote? Or how did... Yeah, it was an unfinished basement that we turned into the space that you saw. Um, and it had been a long, long, long-term vision. Like eventually that will happen. Um, and so it was a multi-year fundraising process and then we made it happen. But decision-making happens in teams. Happy to talk more about it if mm. you want to touch. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, what a rich experience hearing from each of your communities and 
yeah, it sounds like each in your own way, you're doing really important work in terms of bringing to life intentional community. And yeah, and especially you all at Canticle Farm with, with really uh, bringing to life this, this vision of how we can do work around social justice and the community in an urban context is just it's really really incredible so thank you all for your time and i see we are at time and thank you everyone who is listening um would love to get your feedback on this event um, we do have an uh, evaluation forum uh here let me i'll put this in the chat for you all would love to know your thoughts on how this went ideas for future virtual tours we are doing this um, virtual tour event with different intentional communities on the fourth thursday of every month so i hope to see some of you back for the next time we do this and uh yeah once again thank you all so much and uh we can just um in our mics and say goodbye to each other and then we'll close out Thank you. Thank you. Good to meet everybody. Good to meet everybody yeah. virtually. virtually. <laughs> Come visit. Yes. We have guest rooms. All right. Yep. There you go. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye.